This is the Midnight on Earth podcast with your host, Jake Weaver, engineered by Cedric Swan. Hey, everybody, we're back. Another episode of Midnight on Earth. I'm your host, Jake Weaver, and we're here to bring you more knowledge, more lights, and more love. We are here with yet another legend, incredible human being. His name's Paul Stanford. If you know that name, you know how much work this person's done for cannabis. And I'm so excited that we're here talking to him. But first, before we talk to Paul, I need you to do something for me. What's that? Follow me on Instagram at midnight underscore on underscore earth. That's the address. Go there. Please follow me. That's how we get more stories out there. These people that are on here, these legends, these human activists that have given so much. We want their stories out there to more people. Follow us on Instagram, Spotify. You can follow us there. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you go to get your podcasts, click the button that connects us. So then you get notifications that tell you when an episode comes and it it just connects us forever. And the last thing of course is please, 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 please tell a friend, tell a friend that you know, that loves podcasts, that loves these type of conversations (laughs) that are so fun and enlightening. Tell them about us, bring them here. Midnightonearth.com. All right. So now that that's out of the way, I'm going to introduce you to Paul, but first I got to read his bio. Paul Stanford is an American political activist and businessman who is also the founder and president of the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation, THCF Medical Clinics, and the Campaign for the Restoration and Regulation of Hemp. Stanford founded the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation in 1999 in Portland, Oregon, and the group claims to have helped over 250,000 patients obtain a legal permit to use medical marijuana in the States where it is legal and where THCF has clinics. THCF was the largest chain of medical marijuana clinics in the U S with clinics in 12 States. Mr. Stanford is also a master cannabis grower who has won many awards for his medicine. He is also the founder of the hemp and cannabis company farms. The hemp and cannabis company farms are award winning cannabis cultivators who produce some of the most potent and effective cannabis on the planet. I'd have to agree. THCC farms grows the medicine in States and countries where medical marijuana or adult recreational use are legal. Of course, the farms cannabis garden in Portland, Oregon, which has been featured dozens of times on local and national news is the most high profile medical cannabis garden in America. And lastly, Stanford has won awards for his medical marijuana and has given away over 200 kilos. And that for us Americans, that's like, you know, hundreds of pounds. He's probably given away hundreds of pounds of free marijuana a year to sick and dying patients over the last 12 plus years of his life, even more. Stanford won the top three places in the 2008 Oregon Medical Cannabis Awards, he took first place with his version of a strain known as Lemon Pledge. Second, with a strain called Trainwreck, that's a classic strain. Third, with Dynamite. Stanford also won an honorable mention for best flavor with Green Lantern. Hello, Paul. Thank you so much for being here today. Is there anything you can add to that? Well, it's a little dated. Um... I've been through a corporate takeover, so I don't have uh, offices in as many states anymore. My uh, company that I started actually is now traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And just uh, a week ago, it spiked in value up to about 800 million Canadian dollars, well over 500 million U.S. dollars. Okay, I thought it was like 50 bucks, but okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So Over a half a billion dollars in American money just last month. But I've only got now with that spike about $40,000 worth of stock, which is uh, an insult 
Um, I was robbed. I had a real piece of property stolen from me as well, a house where we grew that medical marijuana, award-winning medical marijuana here in Portland. But now I have just a small garden out in Hood River. And so, uh, but I'm still growing medical marijuana. I actually... And you have a clinic here as well. I have a clinic here in the United States, here in in Portland, Oregon. That's the only one I'm operating. I'm actually operating in competition with my old business. So Paul Stanford Medical Clinic... Yeah, yeah. Well, we 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 use that name during the corporate takeover because okay. they they came in with forged documents <sighs> and they spent two million dollars on attorneys. This is the second episode where we've talked about court cases with forged documents. Yeah, uh, and just- the court just accepted those, and uh, uh, they took control of my business. And oh my I spent one hundred and seventy thousand dollars on attorneys in about six months, and then my attorneys quit because I couldn't keep paying them hundreds of thousands of more dollars. The other side, they spent $2 million in attorneys over three years, and I demanded a jury trial. So after three years, they dismissed their case. So after taking everything from me, including piece of real property, uh, my business, firing my wife and two of my children and my partners and leaving me on the hook as they closed various offices and my personal guarantee was attached to them. Um, it's a long, nasty story. But it's one aspect of your incredible life. That's because true. Because that's that's, true. It's, it's hard when you're dealing with neg- negativity it's, because yeah. something that you put so much into, so much energy, it's literally it's so funny because we were literally talking about the same thing previous episode but with a comic book company it's just it's so wild we're now talking about this with paul another legend like jim shooter with his cannabis company but that negative situation that well you know it's opening doors to new things it, that's it, for sure and, and you've I, given so much of your life to cannabis I you mean. mentioned uh, that i was i gave away 200 <laughs> kilos a year it's actually 200 kilos a year okay for a year for 12. um over 12 years, years. Okay. it was it was over about six thousand pounds yes of a free marijuana i've given right. to oh, sick yes. and dying patients yeah aids yeah. And cancer, I still do. cystic I still fibrosis do. tuberculosis yeah. all the things that cannabis helps people with it's such a healing plant we're in the future now things have changed quite a bit since you started let's go back a little bit i want to talk about the beginning of your life let's just talk at the very beginning so you were born. No, I'm just kidding. But the very beginning, when was the first time that you got exposed to cannabis, whether it was an article or your neighbor had it when you were, well, really you know, young? I was a kid in Dallas, Texas. Okay. And so, uh, they had before the dare program, we're talking back in the 1960s and, and early seventies. Um, they had police that would come into your schools with little, uh, trays, covered things. They'd show you very, these are the drugs that you shouldn't use, you know. And they showed movies like Reefer Madness was right. one of them and other movies that, uh, so that was really my first known exposure to cannabis. And uh, so, wow, well, my, my good old f- Uncle Sam, you know, came yeah, in and made police, sure you knew about weed. Texas police came <laughs> in and told me theirs. But, uh, and then my friends in the early 70s said, you know, their brothers use marijuana and it's not bad. And I was actually at a, a babysitter's house and her son was back from Vietnam. And I first smoked marijuana with him. Oh, wow. A few times at the babysitter's. Uh, babysitter's boyfriend. The, no, the babysitter's son. Babysitter's, the babysitter's son. son. Oh, okay. Back from Vietnam. And so uh, that was my first experience. I. Uh, how was it? I, I the first time I didn't really feel like I got high, but the second, third time I started to, I really liked it. I laughed a lot, okay. seemed fun, but it, it led me to do other research. I was always uh, oriented uh, a, a voracious reader, and back in the seventies, there were truthful books about marijuana in the libraries, even in the high school, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, I saw that the laws against cannabis did not match the 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 science that was in the books about what it caused and then i had a purient interest in in playboy magazine okay and uh <laughs> they they covered marijuana in playboy magazine and in fact you hefner was the first sponsor for the national organization for the reform of marijuana really? laws yeah normal so, normal wow. he was their first big backer 
Wow. And so uh, there were ads in Playboy for normal. So I, I learned about that. So I was aware there was a movement to legalize marijuana. And so... Um, and that's when you noticed it was under persecution. Here you yeah. had this experience. It was fun. It was funny. You're noticing it and doesn't back match then, up with what you know, the marijuana was even more prevalent than it is today, even now with it legal. It was... Really? Especially with young people. It was... Uh, something in the 70s that was prevalent and uh, very much okay. so i mean you might have seen movies like dazed and confused or something that's kind of the the era that i grew up in was it really was the cannabis that was around then was it really lower quality as people say as compared well, to now? you know it was it was it's okay. not there was some that was better i remember getting acapulco gold which was really kind of yellow and was it seedless no no, it okay. was all seeded back then. Okay. I, everyone would uh, get little holes in their shirt from the seeds popping out and burning <laughs> little holes in their shirt. It was, it was inevitable. But uh, anyway, I, I realized that uh, marijuana was a good thing and that uh, the laws against it were wrong. And so I uh, was attracted to it. And, you know, I think uh, it, 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 draw some of us to it because of its relationship to spirituality. You yeah. Know? It opens and, you up in a spiritual yeah. way. And the thing is what I've learned and what I talk about, I, I go and I give talks in, in various places. My next one will be in Cali, Colombia at the end of March at wow. the Copa Farallones. Okay. Teresa and I went to Guadalajara to the, uh, uh, Copa, uh, Jalisco uh, in November. And I was the keynote speaker at the Texas Hemp Convention last January before the big lockdown. But one of the things I talk about is the first 25,000 years of cannabis. Okay, let's hear about it. Um, well, I went to school in China back in uh, 88. All the classes were canceled in 89 because of Tiananmen and the big national uh, riots. So, so they this canceled is, all classes. When you for say, Americans. when you say school, you mean college? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was a foreign exchange program through Portland state university. Okay. I initially, uh, went to evergreen state college in Olympia, right. but then, uh, uh, went to Portland state later with an idea that I would learn Chinese and go to China and find hemp for paper and fabric and import hemp for paper and fabric. And I actually did do that as a business. Yeah, I actually 88. saw some. You have some right yeah. here in the office. You actually sent yeah. me some last time we talked. Every, but every patient that comes in our clinic these days, <laughs> I try to give them some notepads on uh, hemp paper. I want to back you up a little bit, though, because you are a cannabis activist. That's a big part of your life. You, you've yeah. done so much for the, for the cannabis movement and the legalization movement. But you had a uh, your first protest at the White House in 1978. Yeah, so that's wanted, the, the White House smoke-in, which kind of started in about 76. It actually, it started a couple years before that, but it wasn't called the White House smoke-in until okay. 76. So I, I went in 78 and uh, met a lot of people that became my mentors, uh, uh, folks with the Yippies, um, Dana Beal, and... Uh, uh, Todd McCurria, a, a psychiatrist out of Berkeley who graduated here in Portland at Reed College back a long time ago. But oh, wow. he was a uh, uh, seminal cannabis activist in, back then. And, so, and a lot of people that were really working hard early on. Yeah, like yeah it was it was pretty unusual situation back in 78. Uh, it was highly politicized. Uh, um, anyway, that was my first <laughs> cannabis uh, well, like, it seemed then to I later ignite a fire though. I was yeah, say. later I contacted the Yippies when I moved to Washington State to go to Evergreen State College. And I started uh, working with them and organized a couple of their events. They had a Rock Against Reagan tour. They came through. I, I got uh, permits at Seattle Center, uh, where the Rock and Roll Museum is today, but also at the State Capitol in Olympia. And, uh, after doing that, I contacted Normal in Washington, D.C., and at that time there was a guy named Kevin Zeese who was the director of Normal. This is 1982, and he said, will you be the state director of Normal? And I was still college in, in college at that point, so I said yes. They sent me a, a 16-millimeter reel of the movie Reefer Madness, so I went to 
starting at Evergreen State College, went to various universities showing this movie and talking about how we should do an initiative to legalize marijuana in the state of Washington. Well, I had a break in 1982, summer break that was about seven weeks long. So I decided to go down to Los Angeles, primarily to try to get on TV game shows that are based on trivia. Things like Jeopardy! Today, at the time they had shows called Tic Tac Doe and The Joker's Wild. Because you're a pretty smart guy. I'm quite trivial. I can answer <laughs> a lot of those uh, trivia questions. I still enjoy <laughs> of course. taking little trivia quizzes and in, in contests like Trivial Pursuit. And so, but while I was there, the first couple of nights I stayed in a hotel. Then I got a week at a KOA campground in Berkeley. Okay. I got free tickets to go see The Tonight Show. I had a front row seat at a Bob Hope show. Interesting. Uh, but I was a contact in this Yippie magazine overthrow. Well, there's another listing in Los Angeles in the Yippie magazine overthrow, and it was called the Reefer Raiders. So I contacted the Reefer Raiders, and I said, I'm Paul from the Evergreen Yippie chapter, and I ended up staying in the blacklight room in a head shop called heads and highs for about three weeks. I actually got a job registering voters in front of the Santa Monica DMV for Tom Hayden, who was also one of the Chicago seven or Chicago eight. And I did that. I saw Jane Fonda once. But I didn't did really you ask her. her about cannabis? No, no, I didn't ask Tom Hayden about cannabis either, but I was staying at this heads and high shop. There's a guy who ran it named Captain Editor. Everybody called him Captain. And it was right on Van Nuys Boulevard, which was quite a scene in the day. They closed the whole street down at night because of the low riders. It was, it was quite odd. But just after staying there, I was leaving town and Ed Adair says, you got to meet my partner before you leave. Go down here to this shop called High Country just to a half block off of Van Nuys Boulevard and meet Jack Hare. And so I, I went down and met him. He took us out to eat, uh, took me out to eat at a restaurant and just as I was about to leave town. And we talked about how there was this initiative in Oregon that had almost made the ballot then in 82. It made the media saying that they, and Jack had worked on the first marijuana initiative that had ever made the ballot in the United States in 1972 in California. Yeah, he's a very famous personality. And for people around the world that don't know who Jack Herrera is or Jack Herrera is, he is an early cannabis activist, much like Paul. And he created a lot of the famous strains that are out there. Well, he didn't actually create them. The guy who, there's a guy in Amsterdam uh-huh. who owns a company called Sensi Seeds. Ben Dronkers is his name. Okay. And he created a strain that he named after Jack Herrera. Oh, uh, okay. But Jack wrote books. And so his very right. first book that he gave me in 82 was a cartoon book on how to grade marijuana on a scale of one to 10. And so that was his first book. And then, uh, in, so I met him in 82 and then in 1984, I graduated from Evergreen. I decided to, and I was Washington state coordinator for normal. And I knew there was an initiative petition in Oregon so I came down to Oregon in the summer of 82 to help the Oregon Marijuana Initiative. And two or three weeks later, Jack Herr moved to Portland to work on the Oregon Marijuana oh, wow. Initiative. And in the end, we ended up putting it on the ballot in 1985, which was the second time that marijuana legalization was voted on. Uh, there was a group of people here that we came to work with, though. It wasn't just we showed up and showed them what to do there. There were people, uh, a fellow named John Sajo was the... Uh, the spearhead behind uh, the Oregon Marijuana Initiative, which did make the ballot in in 1985 for a vote in 86. So there was a little infrastructure there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And a group of people that were working on making the ballot in a petition drive. It was already going on. Yeah. So we just came to help the ongoing petition drive. Okay. But uh, we actually f- failed to make the ballot in 84 then came back and made the ballot in 85 for a vote in 86. That's still the record for the earliest any initiative has ever made the ballot in Oregon State, more than a year before the election. But that triggered blowback from the Republican presidential administration from Ronald Reagan. So Ronald Reagan's (laughs) wife, uh, Nancy Reagan, 
she was known for the Just Say No Just campaign. Just Say No. She toured the state for three days. And the very first drug czar that, that had that title, the first head of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, which is a White House uh, office, was the vice president, George H.W. Bush. George H.W. Bush toured Oregon for 13 days, building opposition, beginning like eight months before the vote, building opposition to the Oregon marijuana. So they were just really familiar with what you were doing and they wanted to stop. Yeah, exactly. In fact, Ed Meese was the attorney general at the time. He sent all the U.S. attorneys from all the Western states came here to campaign against us. Even though there's a federal law that says non-elected public officials cannot work on electoral politics, uh, political campaigns, me said marijuana legalization was not a political issue. It was a law enforcement issue, and therefore they could violate what's called the Hatch Act. Yeah, it was a loophole. To, they found, they he created, created their one. Own he loop. created one for himself. And since he was in charge of the Justice Department, you know, he could do whatever he wanted. So uh, Good old George Bush. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, uh, hopefully the real history about George Bush will come out one of these days. Uh, I really believe. Well, there's pictures of him standing in front of the Texas School Book Depository when JFK was shot. Oh, he was. So, the history of that guy and his family is yeah. no bueno. The, uh, the ships that went to the Bay of Pigs back in 1961 when, we, when the CIA invaded uh, Cuba with some Cuban dissidents or freedom fighters, whichever way you want to look at it. One ship was called Barbara, named after George H.W. Bush's wife, and the other one was called Houston, which is where George lived at the time. So, Do you know about Geronimo's skull? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. That's, in fact, that's the grandfather the stole yeah. Geronimo's skull in a ritual, the skull and bones ritual at... Uh, Maybe, was it at Stanford? Actually, it was a no. It, here, Geronimo's here. skull was at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Yeah, at, but the, uh, he stole it. It was George yeah. Bush's grandfather. Yeah, yeah, and he was at Yale. He was Yale. at Yale. Okay, yeah, okay. I knew it was one of those guy. Ivy League Bone schools. In school, yeah, Skull and Bones was at uh, Yale. We yeah. love talking about this stuff on the podcast. We're just like, you know, we're talking about so many positive things because Paul's given his life to cannabis, and you know, we're here celebrating cannabis and loving cannabis. And, you know, Paul, one of the things that you did, you were one of the first proponents of the revival of hemp paper, like you said, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I imported hemp paper and hemp fabric starting, I started looking for it in 88 and I brought samples back starting in uh, 1989 and 90. And then I had my first loads, 48 tons of hemp paper. And did you get a bunch imported. of pushback on that at first? Like were people like hemp paper, like, or is this going to get people high? Like, was you there know, there was resistance? a lot of interest in it. I wouldn't oh, call wow. it pushback. I mean, we got some free publicity. We oh, made good. a major write up in first, I think was the Chicago Tribune and uh, in uh, popular science. Uh, I was even contacted by the PBS show, the magic school bus about how to make what? paper. And so they were doing a show on the magic school bus, an animated cartoon show for kids. And they touched on various science issues and they did a show on how to make paper. So I, I consulted with them. Wow. Another, but, another amazing thing. Yeah, on your I worked resume. with green Greenpeace. Uh, and there was a, one of the biggest environmental movements in the history of Canada to stop logging on Vancouver Island at the Clackwatt Sound. I worked with them. They printed a lot of their materials. I actually got our paper in about 40 different Kinko's. Of course, Kinko's sold out several years ago, and now they're the FedEx stores that you right, see around. Right, Kinko's FedEx, yeah. Yeah, and so... So uh, that you had to deal with them. They were stocking yeah, your Yeah, first paper. in Berkeley, we uh, created some uh, uh, graphics. We had a, a big poster that went behind a copying machine that some said, some machines have a mind of their own. This one has a conscious and it talked about how it's running hemp paper and wow. all that. But the, we had some quality issues, too, that caused some, some problems, obviously, from China. Well, it, it was still while. new. That's the it thing. It was. It was. And getting back to China, let's circle back to that, what you were saying. You went to school in China, right? What was That's that right. like? Tell me more about that. Um, you know, I, I enjoy China. I had a, uh, an interest in Chinese culture from an earlier age. Back when Nixon went to China in 72, I... Did a lot of reports in my sixth grade class back then. But uh, I went to school and found uh, the Chinese Hemp Institute. It was a new institute that's only two years old in Shandong province in the city of Tian, which is 
where the eastern sacred mountain of China is. It's also the home of uh, uh, Confucius. And so oh, wow. Confucius' uh, legacy is there. And uh, anyway, I started importing hemp paper and fabric. And uh, uh, I, I studied Chinese language and culture. So I learned quite a bit about Chinese language. And I found out about some of their spiritual practices uh, if you'd asked me as a teenager what my religion was from the age of 13 to about 18, I would have told you I was a Taoist. That just shows how much I was interested in Chinese culture. Uh, the Tao is, uh, uh, there's a book called the Tao Te Ching that has a few, I think it's 90 short uh, philosophical uh, chapters. Well, isn't it just kind of like it's everything? The Tao is like everything, spirit, way, matter, and, yeah. and also... The, the way to live. Right? Yeah, exactly. And it, anyway, so I went to a lot of different Taoist temples as well as Buddhist temples across China. Uh, because I was a student there through Portland State, I, I had a student ID, so I had reduced rates at hotels and on trains. And I learned about uh, Chinese ancestor worship, which uh, a lot of it was based on cannabis, and cannabis played a central role in Chinese ancestor worship, there's a thing called the Wu Fu or the five levels of mourning that were imposed by law in Chinese culture up until the communist takeover. So ancestor worship, is that what you're talking yeah. about? Mm -hmm. That's the primary uh, traditional belief, spiritual belief and practice in China. And so one of the things that people do today and since 2000 years is they burn items that are made of hemp paper, uh, money, houses, things like that, on their ancestors' graves on certain days. And they leave food out for, for their ancestors that they eat later. They call it ghost food. Anyway, I took some anthropology classes and Eastern Asian philosophy classes as well. And so I learned about the wufu and how it was practiced, still is practiced in uh, non-communist Chinese cultures like Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, they still practice the wufu. And part of that is there's five levels of mourning. And so one is the, at the top level, if your father, your grandfather passed away, you had to carry a hemp staff, a big hemp stalk, and you had to wear a hemp hat, and you had to wear rough hemp clothing, like rope clothing, for 18 months if it was your father or your grandfather. And this was prescribed by law. If you didn't do it, you'd be punished. And there were lower levels uh, the farther you got away from that being your father or your grandfather, the less stringent the requirements were. Maybe you'd have to carry the staff for six months if it was the third level out. But even today in traditional China, they continue to burn hemp paper and they wear a white hemp collar uh, when their ancestors die, when they're in mourning. It's still traditional mourning. Hemp clothing is considered old-fashioned in China. Um, that's interesting because it's been such a part of their culture for so long. Those Mao suits that you might have seen uh, Chairman Mao and other people wear during the communist revolution, they were made of hemp. They were made of hemp. And it's, it considers it wrinkles very easily. That's what the Chinese So even say. in an oppressive regime with that lifestyle and the way those people were living at that time, there was still some consciousness manifesting in things like hemp production and hemp usage, like, yeah. They at least cared a little bit. They just well, it was in their culture going back, you know, thousands of uh, years. Okay. And so they couldn't completely wipe it out. And people, just like uh, in, in the Soviet Union, they didn't wipe out uh, Christianity. Uh, they, did, they haven't completely wiped out spiritual practices in communist China today. But, Interesting. Uh, yeah, that's true. Chinese culture, uh, j just they invented paper. So paper came from China. And they have a myth about it where this uh, Chinese monk, a eunuch in the imperial court named Sai Lun, he uh, invented paper, but no one would pay attention to it. So he got his friends to declare that he was dead and he was buried. And they had a hemp reed where he was breathing underground. And so he told him, this is the myth. They told, his friend says, if we burn hemp paper on his grave, he will rise from the dead. So they burn hemp paper dug him up he was alive so they that's the myth of the power of 
burning hemp paper in Chinese. Uh, so it's very beliefs. powerful. It's just very potent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And so then uh, if you go to Japan, their primary religion is Shinto. And so if you go to any Shinto temple today, you'll see hemp ornaments all over the temples. Uh, the monks have to use hemp paper and hemp cloth and hemp rope in their ritual. The imperial family of Japan, they have to use hemp in their uh, coronation ceremonies. And in fact, there's a family in the northern island of Hokkaido in Japan that uh, has been growing hemp for the Japanese imperial family for over 1,300 years. Wow, the Hokkaido family. Well, it, the island is Hokkaido, but okay. it's the Michi family. I actually Michi. met them at in 2016 at the uh, International Hemp Environmental Conference at the Kyoto uh, Conference Center, where one of the first environmental conferences was signed by the United Nations to limit greenhouse gases. That but must have been pretty powerful. To meet it guys. was. It was a pretty neat. He, he put a presentation on uh, and uh, showed a lot of pictures. I've, I've still got you know the pictures and recording. And One of the people who presented there was the prime minister's wife, the prime minister of Japan, the longest serving prime minister who just stepped down about six months ago as we're recording this, uh, was uh, Shinzo Abe. And his wife yeah. is a Kie Abe. And so Akie Abi had come out in the media in favor of hemp, and hemp is traditionally used by Shinto temples. In fact, the only people who can legally grow hemp in China today are this Miki family on Hokkaido and this one company that supplies hemp rope, hemp cloth, hemp paper to the Shinto temples all over Japan. Wow. But uh, uh, the so prime minister's it. wife there— and, came and talked about the belief in uh, hemp spirituality and uh, how she had a sacred feeling around hemp plants. She revealed that her husband used medicinal cannabis. That's still not widely known. It's unknown in China. He had ulcerative colitis. In fact, he stepped down as prime minister about 15 years ago and then came back two years later because of his ulcerative colitis. And then he stepped down again about six months ago because of his ulcerative colitis. But he's been using cannabis preparations orally well there's on one that. thing that i want people to understand because this is something that as a person me personally as a person that's been using cannabis for you know over 20 years the distinction between hemp and the type of cannabis that you would smoke or buy at a dispensary isn't as far as you would think because i personally always visualized hemp as a reedy plant male potentially mostly with a couple leaves sticking out but as the Oregon hemp industry and the worldwide hemp industry has grown in the last five years, I've seen boutique level hemp plants that are, look like the best cannabis with THC yeah. that you've ever seen. And it helped me realize that the only distinction that hemp is, is a plant without THC. It could be the most beautiful crystal laden hairs, the most beautiful, gorgeous bud you've ever seen. But it could be hemp. It, it's absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, there are stores all over the state of Texas selling just that sort of flower right now. It looks and smells like, say, train wreck, but it's been bred to be CBD dominant instead of THC dominant. Yeah, just so mind blowing. So it's not that when we're talking about the historical use of hemp and and all of these plants, it's because uh, it's a part of their culture, and also it's not just these thin reedy plants. It, it's the beautiful cannabis plants that they had they probably did have thc they're just saying have you know a lot of those plants probably did have THC. well the thing is it's english makes that distinction you know marijuana is a new word and so cannabis has been the scientific word going back uh, about 250 years but uh, hemp has been cultivated by all agricultural societies up until uh it being prohibited back uh, a little over a hundred years ago. And it could have just been half and half, like a half THC, half CBD strain. It didn't necessarily, it's not like they knew that they were all CBD. Nobody knew then. what THC was. Yeah. And nobody knew what CBD was, but they knew that cannabis was medicine. And right. they knew that it connected them to God. In fact, if you can go to a Catholic church, the largest church in Palermo on the island of Sicily today, 
And so this church was built about 1,100 years ago. Okay. And it's covered in gold leaf art and paintings that have a quarter inch thick coating of glass over the top of them. And there are probably 1,500 different works of art on the walls there. And about 100 of them depict cannabis with Jesus, with God, and Adam and Eve. Oh, my God. With, and this is right in the Catholic Church today. It's the Montreal Cathedral. You can look it up on YouTube. Montreal Cathedral in Palermo on the island of Sicily. And uh, cannabis was part of the uh, anointing oil. And so the anointing oil was something that they used to anoint religious people going back to old Judaism. They anointed David, they anointed Solomon, and that oil was primarily cannabis. It uh, was cannabis oil. It had other spices in it, but in a, 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 about a, a gallon and a half, it would contain three kilos of cannabis. Oh my God. And so they would have you, if you put this oil on, you would have a psychedelic experience. And also it was a healing oil. You know, it was, a, they, the medicinal properties worked on them just as well as they work on yeah, us so today. We're, we're talking about historical cannabis and they say hemp, but it's really just the Christ same means anointed one. So right. just the word Christ means you've been anointed with marijuana oil. And cannabosm, isn't that the yeah, word in the Bible? Cannabosm was one of the words, you know, linguistic pronunciations change over time, but uh, cannabosm was uh, definitely uh, one of the main ingredients in the anointing oil. Well, it's really funny because both the cannabis people and the DMT people claim the burning bush of Moses. The cannabis people say, oh, he went up there, was a burning bush, he had a cannabis experience. DMT people say it's it was something else and he had a DMT experience. Maybe they're the same experience. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Moses, the burning bush, is that cannabis? I haven't heard about the burning bush being uh, DMT. Um, some, some sort of plant that activated the yeah, DMT. There are some DMT plants. I know most uh, organic DMT comes from toad, skin secretion so uh oh, there's plant-based stuff yeah now, I know. And the there are plant-based ones too stuff too there's plenty of synthetic stuff out there people yeah. put it in vapor pens these days really wow. and at festivals you know you go to these festivals and speaking of festivals weren't you <laughs> involved in hemp stock right yeah i helped start well i, I didn't did want start to hemp stock that. which is a a portland festival that went on uh until that corporate takeover made me a pauper but i i funded that i was also the uh uh, presenting sponsor of the Seattle Hemp Fest for about 15 years. And so I uh, helped get that one going. That's the largest one in America. And then I first gave a speech at the Great Midwest Marijuana Harvest Fest back in 1988 in Madison, oh, Wisconsin. In Wisconsin. Uh, in Wisconsin. That's the oldest marijuana event in the United States that's still going on. It started in uh, uh, 1970. And about six months later, they had the hash bash in, in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. That's the second oldest one. In the late 80s and early 90s, the Great Midwest Marijuana Harvest Fest was the largest marijuana festival and protest in the world at the time. About fifteen to 25,000 people, depending on which year you came. Well, it's just, it's changed so much since then. The world yeah. has changed so much. Yeah, everybody, they used to bust everybody at those things. That's what I'm saying. And, and then people worried about their license plates being photographed. They, they worried about their faces being photographed. Yeah. People in this 2021 world don't understand, or maybe some people do the older ones. You understand what cannabis was like when it was totally illegal on a nationwide scale, every state it was illegal. It was hard. It was terrifying. Like, in a way that you couldn't smoke in public or in a s secret place without worrying about being arrested or some sort of legal ramification. All that's gone now in a way, especially on the West Coast, not around the world, you could say, and definitely not in every state in America, but in a general sense, the seas have changed. What, what's that like for you as a person that was like all the way at the beginning or in the earliest stages? Oh, well, that's what we work, you know, we're working for. Right. When I started as a, a teenager, I didn't know it was going to take so long, but, uh, you really thought it'd be over by now. Oh yeah. We thought it'd be over in the eighties, you know, in the seventies, we thought five years, you know, 83, 84, it'll definitely be legal by then. 
uh, but we didn't anticipate Ronald Reagan and the blowback uh, with the Just Say No campaign and the Mothers Against Drunk Driving that reinforced that Just Say No idea and how they gained great political power. And then they came up with these mandatory minimum sentences to put our brothers and sisters in jail. In fact, I went through a federal trial back in 1993. If I had been convicted, I would have gotten for, for growing marijuana. If I'd been convicted, I would have uh, had a 10 year mandatory minimum sentence. Oh my God. And that was before marijuana legalization. So he would have served the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. And there's still people in jail for life without the possibility of parole for marijuana today. And some of them are being released over time. I more and more still on the West coast. Uh, yeah. In federal jails, in federal oh jails. My God. And, How and, is that even possible now? Um, because it's still against federal law. There's still people going to jail, federal jail for mandatory minimum sentences. Hopefully those laws will be changed. I know the new leader of the Senate, the democratic majority leader, uh, Chuck Schumer says that he will be introducing marijuana legalization as one of the top three priorities for the Senate uh, this year. Nice. And so that'll that'll make a big difference. Of course, our senators here, Jeff Merkley and uh, He's always been Ron a big White. supporter. Yeah. And, and our congressperson here in Portland, Earl Blumenauer, is the head of the Cannabis Caucus, along with the Los Angeles congressperson, Barbara Lee. So they've been pushing marijuana legalization. They put it through the House uh, of Representatives last December with the Moore Act. Uh, and so that passed, which would, but it didn't go through the Senate with, under the control of uh, the, the then majority leader, Mitch McConnell of Kentucky. And so, uh, uh, but they're ready to pass it now. And uh, Does it have to go through the process again? Yeah, it's got to okay, go through the whole process again. It probably will start in the Senate uh, this time okay. where it started in the house the last time okay. and what passes in the house will probably pass in the Senate. Then a lot of the restrictions on banking, a lot of the, uh, Oh yeah. The banks will be free. Yeah. The ability to, uh, uh, operate, uh, interstate, you know, Oregon growers can only sell to Oregon customers. Can't sell right. to California customers, uh, California customers, growers can only sell to California people through yeah, their that's regulatory a big system. thing with Oregon farmers is that they're waiting for that interstate commerce because then they can sell their amazing Oregon weed. We do have the best weed in, in the country, I think here in the Northwest. Yeah, I think so too. I take, uh, well, actually, you know, go. worldwide as a person that's traveled the world. I just cannabis. got ju- judging the Jalisco cup down in <laughs> Guadalajara and I'm going to go judge the, uh, uh, Copa Falarones, uh, in Cali, Colombia here, uh, from March 28th till April 1st is when the awards are going to go out. So who has so the I've, best weed? Oregon. Oregon. That's the thing, you know. I, <laughs> of course we I go to these contests and, and my weed's the best. And I've been doing that, you know, since the 80s. So why you know? is that? What what makes Oregon weed so special? Genetics and people, you know, I, you know who Ed Rosenthal is? Uh, he, and, yes, of course. And, classic and he's legend. He's a in classic the grower world. and uh, Jorge Cervantes. Yes, of course. Legend so as Another well. legend. Grower high times uh, writer about cultivation uh cervantes is from portland he's from this area okay and so uh i've known ed and jorge going back to the early 80s and so uh the first good indica strains came out of nepal and india and they went through hawaii and into seattle and the west coast oh, wow. and so is it the good, climate though too? Is it the It has something to do with it. Is it the people? The the energy it's, of the people and their love both. of cannabis. It's both. It's both. There's no doubt. It's okay. the genetics though <laughs> by and large to be able to to grow the the various varieties but, that but, are but stronger. In, in these days though there's so many genetics floating around That's different right. strains you can get clones from all over the west coast you get seeds from all over the world and yet still Oregon weed is the best. So it, 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 there's something else. Do you think there's some kind of magic behind our section of the world what do you think well definitely i mean you know every different area has its own unique uh vibe right yeah vibe biome you know there's microbes in the soil right there that have a huge influence on plant growth and there's uh just the culture and oregon was one of the places that uh uh helped pioneer organic 
cultivation and that that's the, absolutely can, the best true. cannabis plants like the best organic conditions and yes uh, the organic growing culture people some people would assume that it came from norcal and and california and, and there may be a little bit but the nexus of it was really in oregon in places like eugene oregon and portland oregon mm -hmm. where they really had the people that were passionate deeply passionate about growing cannabis designing the nutrients and creating these recipes that they use for feeding yeah and, and breeders were here like dj short he's from oregon okay. created the blueberry strain uh, <sighs> love the oregon blueberry it's so classic yeah there's i a just lot smoked of uh, some of that like a month ago you know, a lot of the different classic strains were developed by breeders here in oregon and, and that so. just makes us the best not to knock other cannabis growers yeah. around the world we know you can grow good cannabis too and maybe if you moved here you might step up your game I've had some people come from <laughs> South America who, who are now growing in uh, Uruguay and, and uh, they, they worked on my garden. So they're, they're taking, <sighs> they're those, spreading uh, the energy out yeah, there that they worldwide. were already working on it before they came here. But uh, you know, <laughs> we draw each other together as a fraternity. That's the thing about cannabis is uh, it brings us together. And that's one of the things that really attracted me to it was the social use of cannabis and sharing a joint among friends and, having a good time. Uh, that's one of the things that brought me to it. And I think that's what you'll see across all cultures. You go back, in fact, cannabis has been cultivated at least 25,000 years, we know now. When I first started studying this back in the early 80s, we knew that it went back about 12,000 years. There's a book by a guy named Ernest Abel called Marijuana, The First 12,000 Years. I read that before I ever met Jack. And it talked okay. about hemp being cultivated by the Scythians in Central Asia. And the Greek, the oldest Western historian was Herodotus. Uh, he was a Greek. And his text talked about the Scythians using cannabis and putting it in a tent and kind of having a steam bath with cannabis. And now we know from archaeological research that in the, the main temple building in Jerusalem, that they burned cannabis inside their little hot box to, in their ceremonies. It's just been with us forever. Well, we do have those cannabinoid receptors in our brain. Yeah, all animals do. And it proves that we've evolved with cannabis for time immemorial. It could well be the very basis of agriculture itself because all of the oldest agricultural societies cultivated hemp. They also, all the, the farm animals we think of were domesticated by farmers that grew hemp. So why did the horses decide to come and live with people? Well, it's because we grew the hemp. And the same <laughs> with the cattle and the goats and <laughs> like, the chickens. Hey, come, out, come hang out with us. We have yeah, the great Yeah, we'll weed. feed you this hemp and this <laughs> hemp seed and this hemp leaf. That's an original idea, by the way. <laughs> That's a Paul Stanford original, but yep, yep. isn't it true that from a nutritional standpoint that the hemp seed contains all the essential nutrients for the human being? So you yeah. could essentially live on hemp seed and a little bit of other things. And the Buddha, they say the Buddha reached enlightenment after three years sitting under a Bodhi tree in Nepal, and he would eat one hemp seed a day. Eat one, and so that's the basis of Buddhism right wow. there. The Buddha became enlightened because he ate one hemp seed a day for three years. Okay. And so it's tied into Buddhism. and it, It's tied into all the basic religions. If you go to Egypt, the hieroglyphics show the goddess of wisdom and education. She's always depicted with a marijuana leaf over her head. So that's the, god, the Egyptian goddess of education and wisdom. And so it's been tied into human spiritual practices going back at least 25,000 years. And like I said, when I first started studying it 30, 40 years ago, we knew about 12,000. Well, now we know 25 to 30, and it could actually be further. You know, it all depends on how long these remnants of these old cultures survive. So why Let's the demonization, though? Because it's in America, you know, people talk about Randolph Hearst and the paper mill and how there was a hemp machine that was just about to hit the market that was going to revolutionize the decorticator from yeah, Schlitteken re revolutionized hemp production but then Randolph Hearst a paper manufacturer and also a newspaper owner put the kibosh and on a forest there. owner yeah but that's Ma just in America so but yeah the, but also the petrochemical industry yeah, the and demonization the Mexican was revolution was part of that as well because okay. the Mexican people the 
revolutionaries in the 1911 revolution, they used marijuana. In fact, the song, you might remember it from old uh, Bugs Bunny cartoons, La Cucaracha. Right, that's the roach. So that's the roach, and they say the mar- the the roach smokes marijuana and goes to town, basically. <laughs> and I have even got a recent video of that where uh, Judy Garland from uh, The Wizard of Oz and other movies, the mini musicals, she's singing. Well, the, actually, the, the last video of our last tape of her with her sisters, the Gum Sisters, because Garland wasn't her real name; it was Judy Gum. Okay. But uh, she's singing this song, Marijuana. I should show it to you. Yeah, you should. And, you know, maybe we could post it on the site for later. Yeah. But still, we play there's it on our show. so much benefit that from cannabis. And you're, and you're noticing and pointing out how it's a part of spirituality all over the world and throughout humanity. But yet, the demonization did show up in all these different places. It was all about money and power and the centralization of economic and political control. And what about spiritual stuff? Is there- well, that too. It was about control and okay. the people who, you know... It was part of the Christian religion until I think it was Leo the Tenth, about twelve fifty A.D. said, "Oh, only the the priests can have cannabis from now on," and so uh, they they edited it out of Christianity. But oh, still, God. there are these churches that were built before that that show its integral part of Christianity. Because it does seem to open the higher chakra. It seems to open that communication, that love, that interconnectedness somehow. And that a certain insight, you know, I, that I, the, I'm not the center of the world. <laughs> you know, it all doesn't revolve around me. There's these other people out there, and it seems to them that it revolves around them. But it doesn't revolve around any of us, you know. And isn't one it of the nice things when you help each other. One of the things Socrates said uh, at the very root of Western civilization was the only thing I know is I know don't know anything. Right. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, that's uh, an insight that you might get from. But these controllers, the these sun. dominators, they want to take over culture. They want to take over. They society. don't want people to think for themselves. They want to think for them. And, and so a certain number of people don't want to think for themselves. And they you know? want to maintain power. But who are these people? Well, Why do they want to maintain power? For wealth and control. You know, it's about wealth and control. And uh, and some people are just misguided. Uh, you know, when their pocketbook depends on it, as so many of these police agencies have, we're just talking about their above board pocketbook. We're not talking about how much marijuana police stole and sold to their friends on the black market. That has been a large part of the reason that marijuana prohibition has been uh, sustained. And the whole idea of civil forfeiture started under Ronald Reagan. Uh. They did not come in and seize your assets that weren't tied to criminal activity until the Reagan administration, these new forfeiture laws. And so, uh, which gave then impetus and also motivation more money for these cops into their system. They need create that money. situations to arrest people. Yeah. And you know, here in Portland and I'm sure everywhere else, the police would look and see, do you own equity in your home? If you do, we're going to bust you for marijuana. Do you have anything of value we can take from you? Those are the priority marijuana arrests that they go after. Yeah, People who have things That's they can the word seize. I was looking for. It, it gives them incentive to yeah, do that. Exactly. exactly. Ugh, it's so brutal. It's just a vicious cycle. And, and that isn't how it started, but that's how it's in, ended up here lately. You know, it started, though, because of the oil industry and uh, the paper industry. They realized that they invested a lot of money into pumping petroleum out of the ground for fuel and cutting down forests to make trees and the chemicals that sustain those industries and the cotton industry as well. They didn't want to compete with hemp. And so they all got behind this idea that marijuana was a deadly new drug. And that's how we got that word marijuana, which actually came from the Mexican revolutionary song, La Cucaracha. Yeah, it's not even real Spanish from what I understand. No, no, it's not. It's not. It's like Mary Jane, but not even really. It came from Mexican slang. And so, uh, and that's shows why, how it was made illegal. It was the Texas oil industry. The first anti-marijuana laws came out of Texas. And so, uh, and the Texas oil industry has controlled the, the power. Yeah, because I do the remember Southwest there's a video on since. YouTube of Henry Ford who made a car out of hemp, hemp uh, plastic 
yeah. hemp plastic rosin, not pla oil plastic, but hemp yeah. plastic rosin. And it was stronger than steel. You can watch this video. Yeah, hemp fiber. The guy's it hitting it, hitting it with a hammer over and over. It's not even scratching. That's actually Henry Ford swinging the sledgehammer. Yeah, too, it's, it, you know, people out there listening, you should check that video out and, and see the history. They knew about this. This is one of those, you could say, a suppressed technology. This has yeah. been one more suppressed technology over the generations. And it's awful. The thing is, it's not centralized. If you want to pump oil out of the ground, you need tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. If you want to process it into gasoline, plastic, you need billions of dollars to be able to get into that industry. So most people can't compete unless you already have that kind of money. And that's it. You know, it's, it's really about, so you can just make it at home. Essentially you grow your plant. You can create all these different things and they don't want you to have that control. That's right. Any farmer can grow their diesel fuel from uh, some hemp and they'll get, you know, 300 gallons of oil and two tons of residual hemp seed protein after pressing their hemp seeds. And they can take that oil, pour it right into any diesel engine today and turn the key. You can take oh marijuana seed oil. And I first did that actually in uh, October of 1990. October of 1990, I went to, uh, there's this lawyer in Kentucky named Gatewood Galbraith who uh, ran for governor a couple of times and Willie Nelson supported him. And in fact, I, got a, I met Gatewood at some normal conventions in Washington, D.C. You know, all, uh, we'd all get together and smoke our Oregon ganja. And so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but he called me up, said, Willie Nelson's going to call you. And sure enough, a couple of days later, I got a call from Willie Nelson and I went down. He was touring at the time with this country super group called the Highwaymen. Which yeah, was, Johnny Cash and yeah, uh, Waylon Jennings. Chris Christopherson. So, I, but I hung out with Willie most of the time. I got to meet those other guys. But, oh, uh, wow. It was pretty cool. They did their show here in September of 1990. I think that was their first Highwaymen tour and then I flew back in October with John Sajo of the Oregon Marijuana Initiative here. And we went and uh, Willie did a benefit uh, for Gatewood. And they poured hemp oil into Gatewood's red Mercedes-Benz station wagon. And then a little caravan of, uh, of cars followed behind him. And we went from Lexington to Frankfurt, the state capital. And Willie and people met there for about an hour with some legislators then drove on to louisville the biggest city in kentucky and willie did a benefit uh, concert for gatewood there but gatewood and that was all on that hemp oil right yeah it was all on that hemp oil. oh my the, god the car was powered on hemp seed oil it made a lot of news at the time and uh well, it is There's so a lot cool. of those different I mean, stories. He's a trendsetter, trailblazer. You know, was was I, I ended up being a grower for Willie for about 20 years, and so I have a lot of Oregon medical marijuana cards as not just his grower, but his wife and his sister and his daughters and his bands and his roadies. Wow, people! I'm now one step away from Willie Nelson, the Nelson family. I just want to know. I want you to know, Willie Nelson. I love you. Your music's incredible. You're also another legend. You're welcome to come on the podcast. I'm here waiting for you anytime you're ready. All right. <laughs> so let's go back a little bit because you are the cannabis man. I mean, you are literally the, a, a, the spirit of cannabis. Let's talk about the difference between chemical and organic growing. And in your opinion, which is better? Well, organic growing is, why? is infinitely better because Tell me you, why. you've got to build up the soil. You know what? Tell me chemical if I don't growing, know anything. Chemical growing <laughs> destroys the soil, destroys the biome and the uh, bacteria that keep the soil alive and growing. And so the most essential thing for agriculture is the soil. And so modern agricultural techniques that rely on chemicals and fertilizers and poisons destroy the soil and make it unusable. You can just go back to... The Middle East. I mean, there used to be these huge cedar forests in Lebanon and Israel, and now it's deserts. You know, they cut them down. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't take care of the soil. And so organic growing is taking care of the soil, and that yields the best crops. Well, what so, do you say to the people? Because I know so many cannabis growers in Oregon, and they have varying opinions. I always grew organically, personally. Mm -hmm as a medical grower and I did have friends that grew non-organically and their 
So many of them don't know how to flush their chemicals out. Well, that's a big thing. Yeah, that's their whole point is they say the science is there. It's just science and they're not, they're using rock wool. And then so everything. And I've used rock wool for clones, but I, you know, and I've seen or hydroponic growers use it as well. Yeah. And that's the thing. So then in, in something like that, would then it be not as bad as long as you flushed everything correctly and really flushed it hard and knew what you were putting in? Is that something that would be like, maybe not as bad as organic wheat. organic wheat well, you know you best. can grow organically in rock wool too you can use organic f- nutrients and fertilizers you know right rock wool is just molten rock that's been made into cotton candy like yes. substance you know yeah like a and soil so, yeah. imitation yeah something to hold the water and the nutrients and, and the roots you know and so uh but it's never going to be a good soil with the right uh microscopic organisms that transfer nutrients to the plants. It's kind of critical here. I'll pull up a few pictures for you. Oh, look, I'm looking at pictures of Paul with Willie Nelson and family. Uh, he's getting an award. There's well, the there's eco the paper. paper. Yeah. Yes. Historical we love Willie fun. Nelson because you, uh, you helped stuff. him get certified with his yeah. medical and, yeah. and his whole entourage, his whole crew, his family, like you said, they when all, I first met him there here in Portland with the highway men, uh, you know, we got him some marijuana and he had me roll a joint about every 45 minutes for four days. I thought you were going to say 45 seconds. No, <laughs> no, 45 minutes. Here. Roll another one, Paul. <laughs> Just like the other Actually, one. Actually, <laughs> you see that volcano vaporizer there. Yes, there's I got a volcano that on the desk. At, I, the, my volcano is in this room on, his, uh, on Maui at his house near Paia. Oh, wow. Because he demanded that night, which this is 2014, I guess. Yeah, to buy my volcano. And I said, don't sell them, Willie. And he goes, here, how much are they? And I didn't tell him, but someone told him they're $700. So he, he put $700 on the table. I said, how can you say no to Willie Nelson in his own house? I mean, there, <laughs> there, was, a, he, there was a big poker game going on around that table. He's probably doing good financially, too. He's I mean. doing pretty well. We know that. Uh, I actually, right after that time in October of 1990, when he did the show for Gatewood Galbraith, I flew to Austin to meet with Willie at that point. And I didn't get to meet with him because the IRS arrested him that day. Right. Classic I think, story. I yeah. think it was because he was coming out in favor of marijuana legalization. So the oh. IRS cracked down and took all his assets and resources, but he's come back pretty well from that. Oh yeah. He bounced back. Yeah. yeah. And he's still with us. Thankfully. I mean, I believe he's 80, 87, what? 87, 87 and in, he's uh, still next month rolling strong. I mean, he's doing pretty well. He's going to go back out on the summer, the, uh, on the road this summer. You know, yeah. Once the but he demanded to buy my volcano, so I sold it to him, and I took that seven hundred dollars and I went to the other side of Maui from Paia uh, to Kihei. It's a very short, you know, twenty minute drive, and uh, I bought that volcano with his. It was exactly seven hundred dollars, <laughs> and I gave him the box and all the other gizmos, but I kept the new volcano. The one he bought was only about six months old. Right, and they last forever. I yeah, mean, yeah, that one's you know look, doesn't look seven years old, does it? But it's no, it looks a year, a year and a half old, and it works really well. It works like new. And yeah. you know this, the volcano was something for people that don't know. It's a cannabis smoking device where you attach a bag, it, vaporizing. It, vaporizing. Yeah, you attach a bag to the vaporizer. It heat releases the THC at the temperature level where it releases without burning the plant matter. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the healthiest way for a lot of people. It is the healthiest way. It takes all the plant oils and resins and turns them into a smokeless vapor. According to a study out of uh, Cambridge University that was done about 15 years ago that compared a pipe, a bong, a volcano vaporizer, and they said that a bong, a water pipe, destroys 75% of the resin and the THC in the burning process. Only 25% gets into your system. And a pipe, it destroys 60% of the THC in the burning process. It turns it into, you know, combustion byproducts. And you get about 40% of it in your system. And a joint's the most efficient way to smoke. And uh, it destroys about 50% of the THC and the other cannabinoids in the burning process, but you get about 50% in your body. The volcano destroys none of it, and what isn't vaporized out remains in the organic material that's left behind. And uh, So you could still use it for baking a little bit? Oh, not only that. I 
give it to patients who don't want to smoke and they put it in little capsules. If you, uh, here it is, you can see I've got a little supply yeah, there. I'm looking at I, a, I, a bag of that. It's, uh, if you ate a tiny level teaspoon of that, you would be high for 12 hours. Really? Because it's been activated. You know, it's already been through the All decarboxylization. Right. And I don't thoroughly vaporize mine. Even if you vaporize it as much as you can, there's still going to be 5 or 10% of the THC left in the organic cannabis between the... So you the, put that in a capsule and you'll have the effects. I have patients who only want that, who uh, who use that to sleep and for spasms and uh, wow. other things. Hey, I just got to ask you, did any of the other highwaymen... Uh, proposition you were th for weed like johnny cash you know or any of the i smoked guys? with johnny and chris then but i never met him again after that okay wow but i continued to have a relationship with willie going on for, for you know, all legends i just yeah. had to ask because you know we're cannabis loving people yeah. we knew they were cannabis loving it's they all had their own little scenes you know and their own band members that came together with the highwaymen right and so uh some of willie's people were in there some of johnny's people most of them took willie's band though so you did over the years have some legal issues around cannabis because it was illegal during the years yeah. that you were really working hard to change I've been that. through several, several marijuana arrests. Uh, uh, the first one was in Portland in 1986 during the Oregon marijuana initiative vote campaign. And it was used against the vote in 86. And so, uh, I was put on probation for, Five years in the end after going to school in China without permission, even though I made straight A's, I uh, was arrested coming back into the country and uh, spent five and a half months in jail at the longest stretch. Oh. And then I went through that federal trial. I got free of the that charge in about 1991, uh, 92, and then in... April of 92, just a few months after the whole probation for that thing, the state charge was over. I got arrested for cultivating marijuana and went through a federal trial in 93 where uh, basically I admitted I'd done everything I was accused of and I didn't, we didn't call any witnesses and I didn't take the stand. <laughs> You're like, yes, we only I did cross, smoke the weed. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, the, the prosecutor, this is a key thing. Uh, well, the guy, I, the, this federal arrest was in conjunction with a, a hydroponic store called Hydrotech. It had offices here, stores here in Portland and in Seattle. The guy who ran Hydrotech in Seattle set up his, because he, he was looking at a, he had a string of different arrests at that point, starting with Operation Green Merchant in 88. The second arrest was in April of 1991. And uh, anyway, he was facing life without the possibility of the parole. So he became an informant and he ran his store in Seattle as oh, a. Uh, like a front for the feds. Right. As a trap, as a trap. And so they would arrest people that would come and buy products at his store, oh. including the drummer of the band Pearl Jam and the <laughs> owners of the nightclub Rock Candy in Seattle. And so. I was going through this federal trial and my lawyer went and pulled his case file in the federal court records. And later the prosecutor said that my lawyer was the only person who ever checked that file out of the federal court. But it had affidavits from him, how he was, how the court should go lightly on him because he was running his store as a sting snitching. and snitching. And he actually, they had him go to bust people that were part of the libertarian party and, in Europe, they they sent him to Europe as a snitch into the Libertarian oh my Party. God! But anyway, yeah, I, I figured if it was good for one thing, might we be good for I something took else. those uh, <laughs> documents and I had a press conference with them and said, you know, he's running this. So it was big news throughout Seattle and even the nation. And the prosecutor pointed out that you know I was the only. They they said this is why Stanford should go to jail immediately for for ten years. You know, <laughs> but uh, the jury would not convict me of that. I wrote an article about it. And anybody can look it up on Google. It's called How FIJA, or F-I-J-A, which is an acronym for the Fully Informed Jurors Amendment. How FIJA saved my life. And so I wrote that just a few months after the, uh, the trial. And I, in the end, I was acquitted. The jury, my lawyer, I had two grams of marijuana in my pocket. 
I had offered to plead guilty for the two grams, but I wasn't going to take the 10 year fall. They offered me a five year mandatory minimum. If I took a plea bargain, I didn't take it. We went to trial. The trial actually started on my daughter's first birthday. And uh, the, the judge was actually pretty nice to me. And anyway, um, you can read the whole story if you look it up online. That has all the details. In the end, though, I was acquitted, and I was found guilty just of possession of the two grams in my pocket. Yes. And because I had the prior, that was a felony, though. And so I had to do 30 days in a halfway house. So I went to a halfway house here in Portland, and the lady who was in charge of the halfway house had already been a customer for my hemp paper. So they were using my hemp paper in their copying machines at the federal halfway house. <laughs> and her son worked in my office so so you were you were pretty taken care of i i just uh that 30 days i came in at about 11 p.m and i was out the door at 6 a.m every day so (laughs) so i mean now can any of those things that you had in the past can they be expunged have they been expunged the federal thing cannot be expunged the state Uh, charge can be expunged i haven't had it expunged yet okay uh i had a one lawyer try to expunge it and they said i had to go through a different more lengthy process and so it hasn't been expunged as of yet and what's Uh, changed since the farm bill passed and that was in uh january i believe of 2019 where mm -hmm. where hemp cbd if it has zero thc or it's like 0.01 percent thc yeah less than one third of one percent yeah that is now federally legal so that you feel like that was the beginning of the federal legalization of cannabis like that was the first step that was yeah that definitely was the first step was a big step forward Uh, it's allowed the whole cbd craze to to boom and uh uh yeah it was a first step but i think that there's this irrational demonization of thc and that it's used to control uh the market where hemp's true potential uh, is to be the fuel in our cars and the clothes on our back and the food on our table. Right. And as long as there are these artificial regulations about THC, it's not going to happen. And that's going to allow the, the current more uh, economically centralized uh, uh, industries to continue to eat our lunch. So is there any growth or movement in those sectors where yeah. hemp is coming in as a potential alternative fuel or fiber or and on an industrial scale? Is that is not that a happening? fuel yet, not a fuel yet, but uh, fiber and building fiber materials. It is. Fiber it is. There's Food. Uh, several manufacturers. Yeah. Well, you can go to the grocery <laughs> store here locally and get your hemp milk and your yeah, hemp right, bread and your hemp seed meal and but in uh, the places where it really fuel, makes a difference fuel, yeah, fuel is the fuel plastic and building materials building materials are starting we're starting to see hemp board hemp flooring hemp uh, is being used there's a manufacturer of hemp guitars and hemp uh, amplifiers wow. yeah there's uh uh and hemp bricks hemp uh crete yeah hemp crete i've so seen it's that ground up houses hemp. out of hemp crete yeah yeah, and so that's becoming a bigger and bigger construction uh, material. So and there so, is a brighter future. The future is getting brighter yeah, for hemp it is, and, and it its is. uses. Yeah, you know, uh, I don't think CBD is really going to grow a lot bigger. I think CBG will. But the real growth for hemp is in building materials, plastics, paper, and uh, a wood substitute, building material. And yeah. and. Would you say within the next 10 to 20 years that we'll see a massive sea change? I think so. Yeah, I think we're seeing things. it. Okay, we're wow. seeing it being pushed by activists and uh, uh, young people who want to, you know, who want to keep having forests and uh, right. skies and, uh, you know, life on Earth. Like people know? that like actually care and love their fellow man and love the planet and right. want to survive. Well, you know, you hear a lot of people say, oh, there's uh, five years left or there's 10 years left. Well, you know, there aren't any years left. Uh, things are changing. They start, the changes started happening a long time before you and I were born. You know, uh, you can go back to uh, 10,000 years ago, the sea level was 400 feet below where it is today. So there's Whoa. been 400 feet of sea level rising over the past 10 or 12,000 years. And so it kind of stabilized for about 2,000. Now it's starting to climb again. 
Uh, so we're always in constant change and growth and, yeah, exactly. and moving forward. And, you know, people have wiped out a lot of life on this planet. We continue to poison it. I think the, there's 40,000 pieces of trash in every square mile of ocean across the world. Oh, yeah. You think that big island, the plastic island in the ocean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a lot more there. But uh, uh, there's uh, uh, hemp is one of the few things that offers us a beneficial way out. And until we can remove, and I think it's it'll happen here over the next five or 10 years, remove the artificial fear of THC, right. the are the regulations that make it more expensive. Uh, you know, it might take more than five or ten years to do away with these regulations around THC, but I think that's critical for the future of life on our planet. And I think it's also uh, critical for freedom in the world. You know, as long as they can criminalize the way you think and how what makes you happy, uh, the the Creates future community. Yeah, the dystopian possibilities are endless. And so uh, hemp is a, the bellwether for the future of freedom for humanity, I believe. Yeah, it is our salvation in the sense that it will help us sustain ourselves because sustainability is the goal. And we've been in this symbiotic relationship with it going back at least 25,000 years where it helped us start agriculture. It's part of all these different spiritual modalities all across the planet. And... Uh, uh, it's something that we're in this relationship and it needs to continue and continue to grow. And we've been through this hundred years of prohibition now, but I think it's critical, especially, you know, given the mass extinctions that are going on, the warming of the planet. Uh, There's just so much that we can affect as humans. Yeah. We can do better. Hemp, hemp can help. I mean, hemp won't save the day. A friend hemp of mine, can help for sure. very <laughs> famous poet, a Native American political activist and leader named John Trudell, he said, hemp is earth medicine and our planet needs this medicine. It's yeah, not just it medicine. Does. The, the hemp is medicine for us, but hemp is earth medicine too. Well, if you wanted to get your medical in Oregon and people wanted to come see you and get their medical there, they qualify, you know, even yeah, we're helping Oregon and Washington patients here in our Portland office. In fact, here in Oregon, we can see patients uh, using telemedicine through apps like WhatsApp or Signal and uh, meet with the doctor in a telemedicine environment. We can't do that for Washington patients because uh -huh. of the Washington Medical Regulatory Authorities. Here in Oregon, the Oregon Medical Board has said, yes, you can use it for telemedicine. Use telemedicine for medical marijuana applications. But in Washington, it's controlled by the Washington Medical Quality Assurance Board, and they say no. Well, there, there are benefits to, even though uh, cannabis is legal in Oregon, there are benefits to getting your medical because not only do you get huge discounts at the dispensaries, you, you don't have to pay the taxes. You also get to grow more there, there's, and possess you can, more. You can grow quite a bit more. In fact, uh, one medical card allows you to grow 36 plants that are less than two feet tall, 18 plants that are more than two feet tall, and then six flowering plants at any one time. And so uh, uh, that's along with four plants per household. Every household in Oregon can grow four plants. Right. If you but, didn't know that, let's fire it up, people. Yeah. <laughs> and it's uh, it, it has a lot of different benefits. So if yeah. you need more, uh, or you want more, you want to save money, you can grow your own. And then you know, I know, for instance, I, I smoke my own almost exclusively or vaporize it. I, don't, I hardly ever smoke. Well, I would believe that, and I think this is true, that the weed that you grow, the cannabis that you grow, has a deeper effect on the person that grows it. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, yeah. And I know no poison's been sprayed on this. Right. No poison's in this ground. I know I've helped take care of this soil for years. And that makes a huge difference, you know. Yeah, and if people wanted to get their medical, how would they find you? Uh, you can find us at uh, thc-foundation.org. That's thc-foundation.org. Or you can call us here in Portland at 503-235-4606. That's 503-235-4606. We also stream our television show. We've done a weekly television show called Cannabis Common Sense since October of 1996. 
and we stream it on Facebook at facebook.com slash restore hemp. So that's facebook.com slash restore hemp. We're live Friday nights Pacific time at 8 p.m. Well, we used to be live. Now it's pre recorded since the pandemic. But uh, <laughs> it still airs on cable television channel 11 here in Portland and Salem at, at uh, 8 p.m. on Friday nights. And that's when we put it on YouTube and Facebook as well. Wow. So if you want to see more Paul Stanford and see what he's about, you're there. Yeah. Yeah. I interviewed a a Houston, Texas activist, Dean Becker, uh, this past week. Last week, I interviewed uh, Fernando Hanau from the Copa Falarones that I'm going to in uh, Cali, Colombia later this month. So, yeah, we've got different people. And I start the show out with news. So I scour the news and I've been doing this. I've been posting hip news online since 19. 1988. Wow. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, so and I printed news, it as a newspaper. And then you get the other things as well. Exactly. The interviews and, and film clips and uh, things like that. Well, Paul, we could talk for hours and hours and hours and hours because you're truly a guru of cannabis. I really appreciate all the work that you've done. You've let people know where they can find you. But before we go, I just got to ask you as a master grower, what are some growing techniques or tips that you have for people that could help them grow better cannabis that maybe you can't find in a book or, or online? Well, you could probably find it in a book too, but uh, <laughs> you know, I don't want to claim that I know things that, that aren't in books because I learned a lot <laughs> from books and I've helped friends like Jorge Cervantes and Ed Rosenthal and others put things in their books. In fact, uh, if you go to Jorge Cervantes, Encyclopedia of Cannabis. I'm on page 100, a little picture of me okay. with some of my plants. It's easy to remember page 100. Page 100. But uh, <laughs> uh, I've given them photos for high times going back and their books going back to the 1980s. They've come and photographed my garden and written articles about it. But nice. I would say one thing that people could do is uh, uh, grow your plants indoors before you put them outdoors. Uh, if you're going to grow, I, I prefer growing outdoors myself because the sun is full spectrum and you can get, uh, get everything you need. Yeah, exactly. And it's cheaper and, uh, <laughs> you don't have to burn whatever it is they're burning to put the, the power through, uh, the light bulbs, you know? Right. So also there is this light science that the farther you get from the source of light, the less intense the light is. So if you're using 1,000-watt indoor bulbs, you can't really grow closer than a foot and a half or it will burn. There'll be too much light. At the same time, you can't grow more than about five feet away. There's not enough light. So there's this this, uh, three-and-a-half, four-foot zone from a foot and a half down to about six feet that is the grow zone from those bulbs. But the the, the buds at the top get a lot more light than the buds at the bottom. Where outdoors... The buds at the top get just as much light as the ones that are off to the side. And ah. on, so you can get just as big buds on the side. I'll show you some pictures about yeah. that as we're talking. Yeah. But uh, that's one thing. Start your plants indoors. Put them out once your day cycle is more than 14 hours. Because if you put them out before 14 hours, they're probably going to flower. Another thing is when you harvest um whoa yeah, those are as, i'm seeing some as, pictures some giant plants 10 feet 12 feet tall yeah, they're, they're beautiful 12 feet and they're 12 feet wide as well <laughs> um but uh another thing is when you harvest the resin glands the trichromes swell up at night and shrink in the daytime okay. so if you want to get the most trichromes or resin production out of your flowers it's best to harvest a couple hours before dawn so that's another secret that most people ah, don't. harvest just before dawn. And like you're going to three or get, four in the morning. We're talking. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Ah, and that's some get, Paul Stanford uh, magic right there. People. There's, there's two plants. Whoa. Two. It, it's just so awesome that we can look at these pictures of these gigantic bushes, just massive. I'll send them plants. to you if you want to use them. And there's, yeah, please do. And, uh, there's no legal ramifications. Nobody's going no, to that jail. That was legal. Nobody's going to jail. That Nobody's property scared. was stolen from me by, uh, this empower healthcare company, uh, but, but, the, but the fact story. that we don't have to worry about any, that anymore. Yeah. Is so huge. I spent about 
two million dollars to put marijuana legalization on the ballot starting in 2008 and i was the sponsor and put uh and the spokesperson for measure 80 when we legalize we put the marijuana vote on the ballot in 2012 and then i came back in uh 2014 and worked on that one as well that's norva part so this is my student id in china oh wow that's i'm looking weird. at a young paul stanford in china his student id a happy guy still a happy guy yeah, still the yeah. same loving happy guy he always was worldwide china america paul thank you so much for being here i you're, really appreciate you're very it very welcome jake thanks for having me yeah we're gonna hang out a little bit more i'm gonna play the outro music and people we'll see you next week there's in jorge on earth oh there's jorge cervantes that's bob Mountain. brother of the leaf we'll see you next week people